Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have the task of introducing myself um, this afternoon uh, because our, our host has been delayed. Um, so my name is uh, Professor Simon Butt. I'm at the University of Oxford and uh, my lab looks at uh, interneuron development. So what I'm gonna do now is share my screen and we can get straight on with the talk. Okay, um, so hopefully everybody uh, can see this. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether or not uh, you can see my cursor, but I will try and give you directions um, at the same time as to where we're looking on the slide. Okay, so the, the title of my talk is uh, Controlling the Flow, Gabriogic Interneurons um, in Neonatal Cortex. And I thought I would just start because um, we're, you know, we're a little slow to publish sometimes, so I thought I would just give you a, a, a sort of the overall view of what my lab does. And I think one of the things that struck me uh, a number of years ago is, of course, that the, the vast majority of us are um, neurotypical. And it, if I was giving this talk in person, we could I could look out into the audience and it's immediately evident that uh, people are genetically different. Um, we all look different. Um, and up until this moment in time, we've had quite different events in our life that have sort of impinged on us. And this is, um, gives rise to the question, you know, how do we achieve normal? How do we, um, you know, the majority of us get to this point where we're uh, neurotypical? And what is even more um, fascinating about that, that, that sort of question is that the nervous system has to, to learn on the job. So what we've been thinking about is what are the constraints on development that uh, ensure that we, we acquire um, you know, normality, that we can use sensory information to, to make correct behavioral choices um, through our life. Now, I have to immediately stress that the behavioral repertoire of a, a neonatal pup is, is, is almost non-existent. Um, and actually, I'm not going to talk about behavior at all in this talk. You'll see that it's quite descriptive. We're going to talk about the circuits that are involved um, and how interneurons contribute to uh, information flow. Um, what I would add is that I think there is some really fascinating work. Um, and in particular, uh, Mark Bloomberg, uh, University of Iowa, um, has recently been, um, you know, sort of exploring how behavior, how the ongoing behavior of uh, a, a pop um, sort of dictates that, that, that flow of information or is related to that flow of information. So our um, working hypothesis is that, um, that gabaergic interneurons are critical, that they, they provide a physiological scaffold um, in the neonatal cortex and are uh, you know, going to interpret uh, nascent sensory information, enable that to, to flow through the cortex. Um, what I should say is, you know, this is my obvious bias. Um, I love cortical interneurons. I'm very passionate about cortical interneuron diversity. But this is not the only key concept that you need to bear in mind as we go through this talk. And um, you know, some of the other ones that I, I think you should have bubbling away um, are certainly the thalamus, um, Gia Lopez Bendito's lab. Uh, we're going to see actually some of her work in this talk. Uh, Rustem Kazipov, who you might have heard uh, earlier on in the week. Um, Denis Jobidon, who has been looking um, at how the thalamus sort of patterns the cortex. It's a wonderful um, paper in, in Nature a number of years ago. And then we've got hub cells, um, Rosa Cassart, who was uh, on, the, on the committee, um, Natalia DeMarco Garcia, uh, they've both produced some excellent work, which is looking at interneurons and how um, interneurons maybe act as hub cells to sort of govern um, the emergent circuit. And then we have more sort of classical um, uh, ideas, things like homeostasis, which again, we'll, um, I maybe will touch on a little bit, um, Gina Trigiano, um, Mafia and so on. And of course, plasticity and critical period. And we've known this uh, since the work of people like uh, Takao Hench um, and John Isaac uh, and Kevin Fox. So 
while I'm going to suggest that gabaergic interneurons are this sort of critical physiological scaffold, um, I do want you to bear in mind all of these impacts. And actually, I think it's a very exciting time for the field because um, all of these ideas, as you will see, are starting to sort of come together and give us a real idea uh, of how cortex comes online. Okay, um, before we sort of get back into development, um, I just want to talk briefly about what gabaergic interneurons do in the adult. And as it says at the top here, um, they control information transfer in adult neocortex. And what we have on the left, the picture on the left here, we have uh, an image from uh, a paper from Peter Samoji's lab, uh, who's also in Oxford, um, from back in 1995. And what they've got here is you can see pyramidal cells just uh, randomly firing. And then at the point where there's this little black arrow, um, they fired a single basket cell. And that's inhibited these pyramidal cells. Um, and then you can see that they're largely synchronized um, in a burst. And you can see that in the raster plot below. Um, then there's another dip as they go through there after hyperpolarization. And again, they're reasonably synchronized uh, for the following one. So what we have here is a, a single gabaergic interneuron has phased those pyramidal cells, has locked them together, synchronized them, um, and that enables obviously summation in the downstream cells from that pyramidal cell and that information transfer. Now, Peter Samoji's lab and many other labs uh, have subsequently explored the diversity of interneurons. Um, and, you know, while we might want to put a number on it, and, I would guess somewhere between sort of 20 and 25 different types of gabaergic interneuron uh, in the cerebral cortex. Um, that's quite challenging for us as scientists to sort of to, to tackle, to try and resolve and understand, especially um, early in development. Um, all of those subtypes do contribute to um, higher order cognitive processing, as says there. Uh, um, what I'm gonna rely on, and actually I think the community relies on, is this image on the right-hand side, which comes from um, a, a paper from Massimo Scanziani's lab back in 2013, where they described, if you like, the canonical interneuron circuit. And one of the reasons why it's nice to rely on this is because all of these subtypes that you can see here, we've got a somatostatin positive interneuron, uh, a VIP positive interneuron and a parvalbumin positive cell. Um, we can target these reliably using Cree driver lines. Um, and so we can explore their function, explore who they talk to um, across, um, a, you know, in vitro to in vivo uh, models. So this is what we're sort of going to take forward. Um, what I do want to do now is just sort of recap briefly, um, so we're all at the sort of same level, um, interneuron development. So um, a whole host of labs have con um, contributed to this body of knowledge, and I've, I've just listed a number down below in um, alphabetical order. Um, but the simplistic view is that there are a number of neurogenic niches in the uh, ventral forebrain, and I've uh, put two here, the medial ganglionic eminence um, and the caudal ganglionic eminence, uh, that will give rise um, to cortical interneurons. And these will tangentially migrate up uh, into the developing pallium, into the cortical plate, um, where they will then integrate uh, with the pyramidal projection neurons, which are glutamatergic. Um, the medial ganglionic eminence is uh, largely defined by a transcription factor called NKX21, and uh, this is an image from my lab where we have used the NKX21 Crete uh, to drive GFP in those interneurons. Um, and then we've also uh, done immunohistochemistry for parvalbumin um, and the neuropeptide somatostatin, which gives us, you know, two of those uh, populations defined in the Scanziani um, uh, canonical interneuron network. Now, in terms of when the cells are born, um, work that we did in the Fischel lab um, established that the parvalbin and the somatostatin from the MG, um, color-coded blue here, are, are some of the earliest to be generated. And then at a delay, 
um, this sort of diverse array of cells from the caudal ganglionic eminence, um, which all uh, express the ionotropic serotonin receptor, the 5-HT3 uh, receptor. They're born slightly at a delay um, and then will sort of migrate upward. Um, I've just removed all the detail from this picture because actually one thing that will then strike you, if we, the, the remaining dash line that I have running here, uh, segregates the boundary of layer four um, and 5A of somatosensory cortex. And what you will see is that there's a more, much more dense sort of uh, GFP profiles uh, in the deeper layers and they're much more sparse in superficial layers. And um, this is, uh, we now know this is sort of reflected it, primarily in the differential distribution of somatostatin interneurons which are primarily located um, in infragranular layers, um, as opposed to the 5-HT3 uh, receptors. And I've picked out VIP positive interneurons in particular, uh, which are in supragranular layers. Um, the parvalbumin cells, we, we find them pretty well all over. Um, what you will see in this immunohistochemistry is that we've got the odd red, the odd blue cell, um, which is not GFP positive, um, because they're coming from other uh, areas of the, um, the basal forebrain, um, and Oscar Marin in particular has been uh, exploring uh, those neurogenic niches. Um, then the next thing to point out is actually that in the adult, um, we have the canonical cortical circuit, if you like. Um, so sensory information will come into layer four. It will then go forward into layer two, three, where it will be processed sideways, um, and then down to the output layers 5A, 5B, and 6. And the VIP cells have these very characteristic axons that are descending down through the layers and perhaps providing um, a feed forward inhibition down onto 5A, 5B, and 6, um, but obviously then feed back onto 4. And conversely, the somatostatin cells, which um, a lot of these are what we call Martinotti interneurons. So they have axons that traverse the whole way up um, up to layer one, um, but they can also be providing uh, feedback uh, inhibition. So let's just move back to the side. Um, here is that canonical cortical circuit. And for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus almost exclusively on somatostatin cells. Um, I'm gonna bring VIP cells in towards the end. Um, but completely ignore parvalbumin interneurons. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the creed line for the parvalbumin line um, doesn't really switch on until postnatal day 10 to postnatal day 14 uh, in somatosensory cortex. Um, and as far as we're concerned, that is pretty old, okay? At this stage, um, the circuit is reaching its, its adult um, state. So what is the evidence uh, for a physiological scaffold? And uh, this is um, published work um, from a, uh, two papers we, we uh, published back in 2016. Um, and most of the work in my lab uh, to date has been in uh, primary somatosensory cortex in S1BF. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is some data that uh, Andre Marquis Smith um, got uh, during his time, during his PhD in the lab, um, where we performed laser scanning photostimulation. Um, so this is essentially a bit like playing battleships. We have a grid over acute in vitro cortical slice. We fire a UV laser down and we uncage glutamate um, across this grid at specific spots in a pseudo random fashion um, to reveal the total columnar input onto uh, the cell that we're recording. And this particular image, uh, he's recorded um, layer four spiny stellates all the way from postnatal day four through to postnatal day 15. Um, we voltage clamped them at the uh, reversal potential for glutamate. Um, and this then enables us to reveal the total GABAergic input onto these cells. And each of these columns is one cell. So it's basically a map squidged down um, into a single column and we've lined them up uh, through development. And what I hope you can see is that the majority of GABAergic input um, onto 
layer four uh, spiny stellate cells during this initial period, which is postnatal day four to postnatal day six, um, is coming from layer 5b. Then, as we head into this window, um, P7 to P9, which is towards the end of the layer four critical period of plasticity um, in somatosensory cortex, we can start to see that the, um, the input from layer 5b is becoming a little weaker, and you can see some more sort of spots appearing. But then suddenly, as we hit the end of this critical period, um, we can see that the inhibition is now largely focused within layer four. So this initial period, um, and Andre did a whole host of work, and I, you know, if it's new to you, I would certainly encourage you to go and um, dig out the paper. Um, what we discovered was that these layer 5b and their somatostatin interneurons um, form a reciprocal loop uh, with the layer four spiny stellates. So we can actually re recall glutamatergic input onto these cells from those layer four spiny stellates. Um, and the layer 5b somatostatin cells at this time point um, receive input from the thalamus. So they're getting thalamic uh, EPSCs. And so we've got this transient loop that exists up until the end of, of the critical period. And if we looked in our brains now in somatosensory cortex, we would be here. But earlier on, this is the scaffold that's in place. And we proposed in the paper that this ultimately leads to thalamic engagement with layer four. So this is literally a scaffold. It's there briefly, enabling um, the thalamus to uh, acquire the layer four targets uh, in an appropriate fashion. Now, um, at the same time, actually, uh, we also published another paper in Nature Communications, and this was uh, the work of Paul Anastasiades, um, where we tracked GABAergic circuits actually through um, pretty well the whole of development across the layers. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a real tour de force by Paul because um, it's a colossal amount of work sort of crammed into one paper. Um, and what we discovered was that at this stage, when we've now only got local inhibition, um, in actual fact, these layer 5b somatostatin cells, so that I put roughly P12 here, uh, are now engaging uh, with layer 2, 3 pyramidal cells. And what is interesting about this, this is actually around about P12, is now when we're starting to strengthen the synapse between layer 4 and layer 2, 3. And so we can see that our somatostatin cell is sort of following the network um, up through the layers of neocortex. Okay. Um, and I want to sort of show you this uh, particular image because um, it's, it's not one <laughs> that's in the paper, although this is a reconstruction that Andre included in the paper, but um, mainly because you can see that the, the, the soma um, of the two uh, layer 5b um, somatostatin cells explode and we've got a sort of leak of biocytin into the tissue. But I, it, it, these have absolutely incredible uh, morphologies and you can see the axons tracing up. These are definitely Martinotti cells. And then you see, um, it's almost like they're going up, up the, the, the septum between the barrels. Um, and then the axons are ramifying extensively in layer four. And actually this cell two is the one that we, we've reconstructed here. And you can see this ramification uh, within the barrel um, quite clearly. Um, what you will also notice is that we've got axons, as I say, that are going all the way up to layer one or the marginal zone, whatever you want to call it at this age. Um, but at the same time, we've got this collateral running back downward. So, and it's actually branching three times. And again, you can see it uh, in, in the reconstruction that Andre did. And this sort of made us think, well, um, maybe there's earlier circuits, maybe it's involved in, in the initial engagement. Um, and then uh, Gia Lopez Bendito's lab published uh, this, this absolutely fantastic paper in science um, this year, where they did, um, they stimulated the thalamus all the way uh, through early development. And this is a still taken from one of those videos. And, uh, you know, I, I stare at these videos endlessly. They're, um, they're really amazing. And here we have postnatal day two. 
they've stimulated the VPN. Um, you can see maybe there's a cell lighting up in the subplate. But what you can see, and by the way, I, I put these layers in, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, hopefully you will join us for the questions and um, she'll be able to tell me whether these are roughly right. Um, but what is clear is that there's activity in putative layer four, putative layer five, um, and up, really strong activity up here in the marginal zone. You can see how maybe this then relates to the morphology of our somatostatin cell. If you're looking for sort of classical subplate, then you maybe perhaps have to go slightly earlier um, to when they were doing this in, in the embryos. Um, the point that they make in this paper is that this columnar activity is established early, is established embryonically, and I, I absolutely for that. Um, and you can see here, this is probably the subplate lighting up here, and then this sort of dense activity. To, to my mind, again, this is probably layer, uh, layer five at this particular age. And so we wanted to explore these early circuits. Are the somatostatin cells actually engaging with the subplate? And I'm not going to go uh, into this in great detail um, because I, I want to sort of show you some um, published work uh, in vivo. But um, Filippo Getzi in the in the lab um, did an absolutely amazing study. Um, I I often describe these as simple experiments, but I can assure you there's absolutely nothing simple with recording sort of P2 uh, neurons, recovering their morphology and doing laser scanning photostimulation. So um, this, was, this was incredibly heroic. Um, what he did was he went in and he recorded um, what are called uh, LPAR1 EGFP subplate neurons. Um, we established um, that there were two morphological subtypes. Um, and the clear distinction is uh, the one on the left here with the, the arrowhead is what we call a, one of these pyramidal um, subtype. It's got a very clear apical um, dendrite reaching up um, into layer six. Notice this particular example is, is actually at a sort of 45 degree angle. It's, it's slightly bent. Um, and then we had a fusiform that didn't have a clear um, apical um, dendrite, usually horizontal um, with uh, dendrites going out either side. And what it transpires is um, that the pyramidal type are the ones I'm showing you at the top here. They have axons that extend to the marginal zone and they also have some collaterals that run along the subplate. And these only ever receive local GABAergic input. And you can see it's quite broad in this map. I've put these vertical lines at where it sort of drops to 10% of the total input. So the pyramidal ones have axons going up to the marginal zone, but get broad local sort of subplate, maybe a layer 6a gabaergic input. In contrast, these fusiform ones whose axons are restricted to the subplate, they get this very tight columnar gabaergic input. And the plot here, you can see the trans lamina um, in orange, and the local pyramidal subtype in blue. What I want you to take away from this, um, and as I say, I do encourage you to go look at the paper because again, we have mapped all the circuit. We've got the glutamatergic inputs. We've also uh, got an interesting finding in terms of the thalamic input into the postnatal subplane. Um, but at this stage, again, we can see this very distinctive uh, layer five uh, input and Filippo shows and demonstrates in the paper that this again is arising from those somatostatin cells. Um, this is the circuit um, that actually we propose and I think the key thing um, I want you to take away is that this sort of unit here, so here's our layer four spiny stellate cell and um, they actually have uh, apical dendrites that extend up into the marginal zone at these very early ages, so prior to sort of P5, um, forming the reciprocal loop with the layer five somatostatin cells, and both of these are providing columnar information onto the subplate cells that receive thalamic input. Um, and what I would propose is that this is the circuit that we're kind of seeing here um, in Gia Lopez Bendito's um, uh, amazing study uh, using the calcium imaging. One other thing I, I should mention, um, of course, this is reflecting my bias on layer five somatostatin cells. Um, I think this marginal zone activity is really interesting. And, um, you know, Natalia DeMarco Garcia, um, she's done some really fantastic work looking at layer one 
uh, into neurons, in particular the Che et al. paper from 2018, um, shows that these are also really important for, for establishing um, columnar activity in somatosensory cortex. And what I would love to know is if these are also participating in this circuit, and you can see that, that really strong activity um, up in the marginal zone. Okay, so what I've done in this part of the talk um, is just sort of take you through some of our published data and um, the work that we've now done in the subplay. And the message I want you to, to take away is, um, that we have this, um, for want of a better word, this incredible um, somatostatin interneuron that sits in layer five um, up until around about postnatal day five, um, it is providing input onto the subplane, okay? Then as we enter the critical period for plasticity in layer four, it now switches, and you, we can see that in our image from that P4 cell, um, it now innovates densely the spiny stellate neurons in layer four. These connections are then lost as we go towards um, active whisking, postnatal day 12, postnatal day uh, 14 onward, at which point the axon now, uh, as Paul Anastasiadi showed, is uh, traversing up and innovating layer two, three pyramidal cells. So at the moment that you need thalamic input or the sensory information to, to get through this network that will ultimately be the canonical cortical network, um, this somatostatin cell is there, is innovating uh, those neurons. Okay, so the obvious question is, well, let's take them out. Let's see what happens if we don't have those somatostatin cells, if they no longer function. Um, and we did this um, initially actually in vitro. Uh, Andre Marquez Smith did this um, for the 2016 paper. Um, and the approach we used was that we did acute in vitro uh, uh, thalamocortical slices. We used a bipolar stimulating electrode to stimulate the VPM and recorded from layer four um, spiny stellate cells. And we actually, um, I know a lot of people in the field use um, various potassium rectifiers uh, to silence them. Actually, what the approach we've taken is we prevent all action potential dependent release of neurotransmitter. So we have a conditional mutant uh, for uh, the vesicle release protein SNAP25. And in, in that um, paper, we demonstrate that if we do this, we lose this layer 5B input onto the layer 4 spiny stellate neurons. Um, I've got a plot here of the distribution, um, the normalized distribution. You can see that in the wild type, which is the blue bars, we get very strong uh, layer 5B input and then it, um, very little in layer 4 at these early ages, at the P4 to P6 window. Um, but in the knockout, we only see local um, GABAergic input. Um, this looks very weak. And uh, the reason I would propose for that is, you know, work from Gord Fischel's lab and others has shown that somatostatin cells are really important for the maturation of PV interneurons. And I think what we, we're seeing here is that we're really not getting, um, the PV cells aren't maturing um, and they're certainly not compensating. So I would maybe argue at this stage, um, there's no uh, homeostasis. In terms of thalamic input, um, we got, uh, quite a pronounced uh, result. At the early ages, we saw inputs in the wild type again, shown in blue here. But in the, uh, the conditional knockout of uh, SNAP25 in these somatostatin cells, uh, we never saw a response. Now it does recover. Um, it recovers um, quite strongly by uh, P7 to P9. So, you know, just a few days, or well, immediate few days after um, this silent period. Uh, we see thalamic input. So this inspired us to ask actually what is the impact in terms of uh, perception um, in, in these animals and so we've now moved in vivo um, and what we do is we do a multi-whisker stimulation using a piezo. Um, we record um, using a silicon probe in S1BF, um, having confirmed the location using intrinsic optical imaging and post hoc, um, because we'd label the probes with, with DIY. And um, we collect a whole range of activity. Um, we've got spontaneous uh, spindle burst activity 
uh, that we see postnatal day five to postnatal day eight, um, which is this earliest window. Um, we look at sensory adaptation, so we do uh, multiple uh, stimulations of, of the whiskers. Um, and we've also looked at speed encoding. Um, and because this is a brief talk, um, I'm really only going to touch on the spontaneous spindle burst activity that we see um, and the sensory adaptation. So this is uh, the work of uh, Liad Baruchin, who's a postdoc in the lab. Um, and I should say that Liad is on the job market. So please do snap him up um, because I think you'll agree this, this is really fantastic work um, and they're not trivial experiments uh, to do. Um, one of the key tweaks that Liad did, um, and uh, you know, I, I think this is a little stroke of genius, uh, was we not only did our somatostatin cells, which is the ones I'm obsessed with, um, but we also uh, did uh, VIP interneurons, so we can target those with the VIP CRE. And again, we cross these with this SNAP25 um, to conditionally silence that population through early development. Now, why do the VIP cells? Well, uh, the thought is they're late born, okay? They're coming from this caudal ganglionic eminence. Maybe they're late to integrate, although I have to say, um, you should check out the, uh, the work of Christia, uh, Christiana Vagnoni from the lab, um, which is now on BioArchive, which actually uh, negates that. They, they contribute to the early circuit. Um, but the other thought was if we silence these, maybe we will sort of boost, we will um, remove this inhibition of the somatostatin cells. Um, and we might see like the opposite effect to when we selectively silence the somatostatin cells um, because we'll get disinhibition of the parameter uh, network through um, this canonical interneuron circuit. Okay, so um, first of all, let's have a look at the spindle burst activity now. Um, spindle bursts in adults are associated with sleep, um, but what do neonates do while well, they sleep? Um, that is their behavioral repertoire. And there's a lot of work out there. Um, I mean, immediately I'm thinking uh, Rustem Kasipov's excellent work, Heiko Luhmann, um, and many others um, that have explored uh, spindle bursts um, and their contribution um, to um, you know, network maturation. And so, this is done postnatal day five to postnatal day eight. Um, we have a wild type at the top, somatostatin VIP. And really the take home of this slide is that the spindle burst duration is normal, no matter what interneuron population we take out. Um, the average frequency uh, or within the spindle burst is you know, roughly 15 hertz, is what we would expect. But when we conditionally silence the somatostatin, um, uh, interneurons, we see reduced uh, number of spindle bursts. We all, at least we observe a reduced number of spindle bursts in neocortex. Um, if we then look at spontaneous multi-unit activity um, in these animals, um, what we see is actually a shift through development. Um, so the first thing that is really obvious and it's significantly different is that at postnatal day five to postnatal day eight, we see this massive reduction in multi-unit activity in the somatostatin silenced animal. They seem to recover and everybody is the same as we go from a critical period through to just before um, active whisking, at which point um, we see that both in the VIP and the somatostatin silenced animals. And we see excessive uh, spike activity, as you can see uh, in these traces up in the top right. Now, the, the way we, we're thinking about this at the moment, and I, I would love some feedback um, if you have thoughts, is that we know um, from uh, Rustem Kazapov's work that the early spike activity is almost entirely associated with spindle bursts. So we're observing fewer spindle bursts in neocortex. So it's not surprising, therefore, um, that we, we get this significant, or we see this a significant effect early on. Um, we, we also know from Alison Bass lab and many others actually that uh, somatostatin interneurons are controlling network activity in the adult. So this would uh, explain basically removing some inhibition from the circuit. So that's why we're getting much more uh, spike activity, spontaneous spike activity. 
And finally, in terms of the VIP cells, um, this sort of fits with um, some excellent work from Renata Batiste Brito uh, and when she was in uh, Jess Cardin's lab, which shows that VIP cells actually are inhibiting pr um, pyramidal cells at rest. And this is something uh, we've seen in, in, in my lab um, when we've interrupted or uh, have uh, interrupted VIP signaling in the developing brain. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Um, and this last few slides um, that I'm gonna go through, uh, we're gonna look at the um, sensory response adaptation in neocortex. Um, so to test this, um, say Liab um, did two stimuli um, at a range of uh, interspike intervals. I'm showing you one here, uh, 250 milliseconds or, or 0.25 seconds. Um, and we then analyze the local field potential, um, which I'm going to argue sort of reflects the lamic synaptic uh, input into layer four, or certainly synaptic activity within layer four. Um, and we're also going to look at the multi unit activity, um, which is spiking the, the neuronal activity within layer four itself. Um, we have focused primarily and certainly the data I'm going to show you now um, is focused primarily on layer four. Um, the reason is it's easy to compare across um, cross ages. I'm showing you the P5 to P8 here, and you can see this really strong layer four response and the multi-unit activity. Um, so it looks like there's slightly more multi-unit activity with this, uh, this second stimulation. Um, and at later ages, yes, we see more activity outside layer four, but you can just about make out, although maybe it's dirt on, on, on my computer screen, um, that there is some sporadic multi-unit, low levels of multi-unit activity in other layers, but just restricting our analysis to layer four means that we can more uh, readily compare uh, across uh, the whole of early development. Okay, so um, one of the sort of first interesting observations that they had had in, in relation to this. Um, I draw your attention to this, these, this gray, light gray um, line here, which is the paired pulse ratio um, at various in, uh, interstimuli intervals um, at postnatal day five to postnatal day eight, which is the time period when we would expect the layer 5B4 uh, loop to be present. And what you can see is um, that essentially we're getting almost failure of the second response um, at these early ages. Um, then it sort of peaks and then it drops away again. Um, and there's some thought that maybe this is sort of engaging um, later circuits into your own, some sort of reverb here. There's certainly the, the lack of early responses, probably because the thalamus is just not transmitting uh, the information um, to the cortex. Um, then again, up to the lead up to active whisking, we still have a similar relationship, although it's flattening off here. Um, and then we hit the sort of what we would like to call active whisking stage. And you can see that it's significantly different from this. Now, when we silence somatostatin cells and VIP interneurons, we don't really see much effect. Um, the only possible effect is uh, that we could point to is that with the VIP cells, um, it looks like we're not getting this second dip. And so maybe they're involved in this sort of late integration um, when you've got stimuli uh, 1.5 seconds apart. But really uh, the impact is relatively minimal on the LFP. And this supports the notion that we're just silencing the cortical interneurons, we're not really affecting um, thalamic information coming in. However, um, if we now look at the multi-unit activity, um, the first thing to note is that P5 to P8, um, we actually see facilitation um, in the second response, and you saw it in that um, 0.25 one uh, example that I showed earlier. Um, but Across many animals, um, we see it almost selectively at uh, 0.5 ISI. Um, this sort of fits with uh, work again from Rustem Kasipov's lab where they um, did intrinsic optical imaging and see this large uh, hemodynamic response in the early S1BF at the same uh, frequency. And also work from Heiko Luhmann's lab, which um, has very convincingly showed LTP in vivo um, at the same frequency. So this sort of fits with their data, um, uh, which was very reassuring to see, because in the somatostatin animal, 
um, we see no uh, facilitation at all. It basically plateaus off. It's a completely flat line here. Um, so this would suggest to us that somatostatin cells are contributing uh, uh, to that, that uh, uh, facilitation in the second pulse. Um, and it's not just a general interneuron thing because when we uh, silence the VIP cells, um, we're seeing a similar response. In actual fact, maybe slightly enhanced, which would back up our argument that the VIP cells are potentially um, uh, engaging with the somatostatin cells early on. So um, I'm going to bring this uh, to a close now. Um, what hopefully I've convinced you in, in this short talk is that um, layer five somatostatin cells are important. Um, they, as I say, we, we've mapped the circuit all the way through development and we see them um, sequentially engaging with the layers that um, the thalamus is engaging, that sensory information uh, is moving into. Um, and why is this? Why, why in S1BF have we seen these somatostatin cells? Well, I think it means uh, they're ideally placed um, to meet those sensory processing requirements. Um, they're in deep layers, they're early born, um, and they have these ascending axons. But, and I, I really must stress, um, and th this is the last slide, um, all interneurons contribute. And the work of uh, Rosa Cassart, Natalia de Marco Cassier, um, and indeed ourselves looking at the VIP cells, Christiana's work, um, suggests that every subtype of interneuron um, is involved uh, during early development. But the system has evolved to make the best use of what is available to it at developmental time, okay? And this, this is an interesting thought. Um, by the way, I should say this, this diagram here is uh, one that we were gonna put together for our SFN um, mini review. Um, and it's just making this point that there are you know, many routes of information into the early cortex subplate, the layer 5B somatostatin cells um, and the 5HT3ARs in layer one. What I like about this is it, it's almost like a sandwich. You've got the bottom and the top of the sandwich and eventually we're gonna have the filling in the middle, actually the processing that's gonna come forward from layer four to layer two. Two, three. Um, I'm just going to put this up and take a sip of water. Uh, other cortical regions, of course, have different requirements. And this is a thought I want to leave you with because S1BF, we've got to get it online early. We've got to get it up and running because touch is going to be important um, to this animal. Um, the one we know from the work of Takao Hench and many others. Uh, has much later critical period. <coughs> um, it uh, is sort of in, into the fourth um, postnatal week. Um, so we might expect that it's going to use different interneurons. It's going to have a different repertoire of interneurons that it can rely on in order to, um, to sort of enact um, that critical period. Um, we might want to think about M1 um, and how M1 relates to S1BF and so on. And, you know, I think this is a really intriguing question um, that remains to be explored. We've touched on it slightly in Christiana's work where we looked at the emergence of the long range connection onto VIP cells. Um, and that's just, that's also sort of kicking off fairly early. Um, and then I have two fantastic colleagues um, in an immediate space in Oxford, um, Armin Lack, uh, who does prefrontal cortex, and Adam Packer, uh, who's exploring the classroom. And they've really taught me to think about other cortical areas. You know, I've got to get out of S1BF. Um, and these are particularly interesting because obviously they're getting, you know, substantial cortical, cortical connections. Um, I should also mention, obviously, we've got Ileana Hanganu Opat um, and my uh, former student, Paul Anastasiades, who's now set up his own group um, in Bristol, who again are looking at these questions of the early circuits in prefrontal cortex. But uh, my guess is they're going to have different interneuron circuits, so they're going to rely on different scaffolds. Um, and we already have some evidence to that. And this is the last thought I'm gonna leave you with. Um, we have from the Tolius lab, we have evidence in the adult that layer four um, interneuron circuits are different in sensory areas. Um, and those of you that heard the worldwide neuro um, talk from Gord Fischel, um, but if you didn't, you can go check out this, uh, this bio archive paper that they've released where they've done um, rabies tracing to look at long range connections onto neurons and find differences.
Okay, so each sensory area is going to rely on the interneurons that it has to compute that information um, and and get it you know, the information through into cortex. Okay, um, that's it uh, from me. I just need to thank obviously all my funders. Um, this is the lab at the moment. This was a, a photo taken um, this summer. Um, at the the hardcore patching uh, squad, all wearing appropriate PPE, um, and uh, particular mentions to to Lea uh, and Filippo Getzi, whose work I've shown today, um, the in vivo and the subplate. Um, also, Andre Marco Smith's co mind, um, and Paul Anastasiades, who's now a PI at Bristol University, and of course everybody else in the lab who contributes and explores um, the wonders of early interneurons. Uh, and my collaborators uh, in Oxford. Okay. All right, hopefully I'm now back on screen. Okay. So I, um, I guess we still don't have a, uh, a host, so I'm gonna just go through the questions. Um, yeah, okay, so first up, we have one um, from uh, Jimmy Dooley. Um, hold on, just making sure we've got everybody here. Yeah, okay, I'm supposed to give some moments, but let's get on with Jimmy's question. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more why you think an ISI of 0.5 Hertz is facilitated? And then why that facilitation goes away when you remove the somatostatin interneurons? Is that a behaviorally uh, relevant ISI? Um, great, great question, Jimmy. Um, uh, I, okay, why do I think 0.5 Hertz is um, the frequency that's facilitated? I think that's because that's what the, the network can deal with. Um, now, what we know is through development, you can see facilitation at, you know, increase, uh, actually, sorry, I should say it's two Hertz. It was um, 0.5 ISI. Um, you know, some people have shown that in adults, eight Hertz is, is, is a good frequency um, for uh, facilitation. I think that's what the somatostatin cells can deal with. Now, why do I think the somatostatin cells are important? Because actually they're the GABAergic input that's binding um, the activity of the cells of the spiny stellate neurons in layer four. They're effectively synchronizing them so that they can then um, fire in an effective way. Maybe, you know, as uh, Heiko Lumen showed, um, we might see long-term potentiation. So my guess is that, um, you know, as then parvalbumin cells mature, again, because the, um, the, the somatostatin cells are, are driving that maturation, the activity, is, you know, thalamic input is driving that maturation, we can then start to sustain um, increased frequencies getting up to sort of, you know, like the eight hertz. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, what happens when we remove the somatostatin cells, of course, is because then, you know, we, it's not so, um, we're not readily coordinating the cells, we're not synchronizing them. Um, and as such, there, we don't see that facilitation, but there's plenty more to go at. Okay, I'm gonna go to the top. Uh, Matt Bucken. Hi, Matt, um, good to have you online. Hi, Simon, what are your thoughts about the, uh, subtype specific role of somatostatin neurons during this developmental process. Is it the same neurons changing their inputs, outputs, morphology, or is there some die off changing of the guard, etc.? cetera? Um, I, that's another really good question, Matt. Um, you know, we, <clears throat> it, with Andre's um, study, we actually targeted a, a very particular subtype using um, the LPAR1 EGFP line. And that's the population that we get um, with these amazing morphologies. Um, there are obviously other somatostatin cells within layer 5A, 5B that have other, um, uh, other morphologies with some with sort of amazing sort of lateral axons and dendrites. Um, 
given that morphology of the L power I showed you, where it has the, the axon going down into the subplate and the axon going up all the way through to the marginal zone to layer one, I do think the L power population are coordinating across the layers. Um, do other somatostatin cells also contribute? Yes. We've tried to get a handle on this with some of the um, wonderful sort of transcriptomic markers that are coming out of um, the Allen Brain Institute. Um, and there was a wonderful paper from um, Alex Nacker, um, gosh, I guess a couple of years ago now, where he also explored the diversity of layer five somatostatin cells. Um, so um, I'm doing what the community does, which is sort of essentially um, brushing over that diversity because I use the somatostatin creed line. Um, but I think that diversity will become important. And I, I, I really hope um, that we will get better resources to target those subtypes and, and, and get at them. Um, my bet is um, that it's the LPAR that's doing it all, but I'm biased in that way. I'm gonna say that because uh, that's what Andre recorded. Do I think some of them are dying off? Yes, um, you know, immediately I'm thinking uh, Oscar Marin has shown very elegantly that there's a lot of interneuron death. Um, but, you know, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, okay. Uh, Najate, uh, Najate, um, let's have a look at your question. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, somatostatin neurons receive high thalamic input early in postnatal development that is transient. Do you know the role of this early synaptic connectivity and why is it lost since thalamic feed forward inhibition in mature circuits is mainly mediated by parvalbumin interneurons? Do you observe this early thalamic transient connectivity on somatostatin uh, interneurons in other cortical areas other than the somatosensory cortex? Um, okay, so um, uh, great questions. Um, do I know what the role is I, for the early thalamic engagement? Well, I again, I would propose that actually the somatostatin cells are almost providing feed forward inhibition. Um, and, you know, so they've, they've kind of taken the place of the PV interneurons because that is what somatosensory cortex has to go with at this time because the PV cells aren't mature enough to enable, you know, the processing. Um, why is it transient? Um, I don't know that it is. And um, I, I, think, I think this is something we, we will definitely explore. Um, whether or not it's as strong, you know, I, I guess one of the things is, you know, PV inhibition is so strong. When layer four PV interneurons mature, they, they're slamming GABAergic inhibition onto those spiny stellate cells. And so maybe we lose, um, it, the inside onto the somatostatin cells at that time, but because their inputs are then going out onto, you know, the dendrites. Um, so I don't know that they are transient. I guess, um, you know, we have the Oleg-3 Cree line, so we could, um, uh, we could check that. And that's a great point. Um, I, I do think some other labs that maybe Gord's lab have shown that it is transient. I think we're of the opinion that it, it maybe sticks around. Um, your second question is, is the million dollar question, um, which is what I was implying at the end. And yes, we have looked in other cortical areas um, and we see different transient connectivity. Okay, we see different scaffolds and um, maybe, uh, you know, hopefully we can all get together for Society for Neuroscience next year in Chicago. I will be giving a talk then and I'd be more than happy to talk about that. Um, but yes, we have mapped different cortical areas and we do see different early interneuron circuits kind of reflecting um, what uh, Gord Fischel has talked about um, and um, also what the Tolius lab have uh, shown for layer four. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, Priscilla Ambrosi, uh, what do you think is the mechanism behind the changes in connectivity of somatostatin cells through development? Um, is the incoming thalamic input necessary for those changes? Um, yeah, great. Um, what do I think the mechanism is? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I would love to know. Um, uh, what we have done, um, 
is we've done a couple of, of uh, experiments that address this point. Um, the, the first is we uh, used what is called the cortex isole uh, model. Um, and this is André Gauffinier uh, and Tazir. Um, it's a science paper from a number of years ago. And this is an animal which has <coughs> uh, no corticothalamic or thalamocortical connections. Um, and we see this layer 5b4 loop disappear at the same time. Now, um, Liad has done some in vivo recordings and actually they're not completely cortex isole. Um, there is a very small uh, delayed sensory input um, that's maybe coming through other cortical areas. And so there is activity in, in those animals. They have spindle bursts. Um, and so we think maybe just the generic activity is causing that change. Um, then there, there's another experiment we've done, um, which is to return to the infraorbital nerve transection um, that we reported in Andre's original paper. And I, I want to thank my reviewer too, um, because reviewer two uh, said, said to us, well, actually, you know, how do you know that infraorbital nerve transection is attenuating sensory input? Um, we make that argument in the paper because actually if we do the infraorbital nerve transection, um, we see uh, a prolongation of the layer 5b4 loop. It is maintained. Um, again, we've revisited that. And actually what it looks like is that there's excessive activity. And so we're maintaining the 5b inhibitory input onto 4 because um, essentially the cortex is panicking. It's getting too much activity. Um, however, it senses that it's then the, we see maturation of the local PV cells, but we maintain that 5B connection as well, just to put an extra break on the system. OK, so what do I think the mechanism? It is activity and it is thalamic. And just to go right back to the start of the talk, um, you know, I. I guess what I should be pointing out is that the interneurons are like the primary responders, okay? They're, you know, the reason for the policeman at the front end was they're sort of controlling the activity within cortex and they're making sure everything is appropriate, okay? Um, and when they get inappropriate activity from the thalamus or from somewhere else, they have to deal with that and they deal with it in some really intriguing ways. Um, and that, that is definitely something that we were continuing to explore. Okay, uh, um, the last question I can see at the moment uh, is Pierre Orhan. What are the trade off the system needs to make an S1BF compared to V1M1? Intuitively, why would it not use the same circuitry? Um, uh, great question, um, and something we think about uh, an awful lot. Um, I think, you know, S. S1 is one of the first senses to come online. Um, and so it, you know, it needs to process that information in an effective way. And at that time, the somatostatin cells, um, oh, uh, the somatostatin cells are, are, are the only ones there. Um, why don't the other ones use it? I honestly don't know. Um, one could imagine with V1, maybe it's because we don't need the tight input output relationship between layer four and layer five because you know s1 has a direct sort of motor component as well okay i've been told privately that we're going to be kicked out in two minutes is it two minutes now um but hopefully pierre that has answered your question okay um but it's it's a great point okay uh All right, thank you very much. Um, look after yourselves, everybody. Um, interesting times, as they say. And uh, hope to catch up with people at a live conference um, in the not too distant future. All right, bye then.